Full stomach refers to the presence of residual solid or liquid foods in the stomach at the time of induction of anesthesia. This condition may place the patient at risk for vomiting or regurgitation of gastric contents, which may be followed by aspiration into the tracheobronchial tree while the protective laryngeal reflexes are obtended by anesthesia. This in turn may cause the vomited material to accumulate above the vocal cord, causing spasm of the vocal cord, a condition known as laryngospasm. This laryngospasm provides a degree of protection against material entering the larynx and the tracheobronchial tree. However, this will also cause apnea. Now, regurgitation is a passive process that may occur at any time and is often silent. It may have clinical effect ranging from minor pulmonary sequelae to fulminating aspiration pneumonitis and ARDS. The most important determining factors for regurgitation are lower esophageal sphincter function and residual gastric volume, which itself is largely determined by the duration of fasting and the rate of gastric emptying. The lower esophageal sphincter is a 2 to 5 cm band situated just proximal to the cardia of the stomach. It relaxes during esophageal peristalsis to allow the food into the stomach and remains contracted at other times. It is the main barrier preventing reflux of gastric content into the esophagus. Reflux is related not to the LOS tone alone, but to the difference between gastric and LOS pressure, termed as the barrier pressure. Drugs that increases the barrier pressure, such as cyclizine, alpha adrenergic agonist, anticholinesterase drugs, and metoclopramide, decrease the risk of reflux. On the other hand, tricyclic antidepressants, opioids, ethanol, thiopental, anticholinergic drugs reduce the lower esophageal sphincter pressure and increase the tendency for gastroesophageal reflux. Gastric emptying results from peristaltic waves sweeping from the cardia to the pylorus. Now, temporary inhibition of gastric motility follows recent ingestion of a meal. Gastric emptying of clear fluids is an exponential process that is the rate at any given time is proportional to the volume of the liquid in the stomach so less than two percent of ingested clear fluid remains in the stomach at two hours emptying of solid food on the other hand is roughly linear it occurs at constant rate and usually begins 30 minutes after a meal the rate depends on the composition of food ingested Typically, 50% of food reaches duodenum within 2 hours, although meal high in fat content may take considerably longer. The rate is also delayed if the mixture reaching duodenum is very acidic or hypertonic due to the inhibitory enterogastric reflux. Now, coming to the effect of aspiration. Injury from aspiration of gastric content result from different mechanisms such as chemical pneumonitis due to the acid content, mechanical obstruction from the particulate material and bacterial contamination and ARDS. Aspiration of liquid with a pH less than 2.5 is associated with a chemical burn of the bronchial and alveolar mucosa leading to atelectasis, pulmonary edema, bronchospasm or reduced pulmonary compliance. The anesthetic management of such a patient may be described in five phases, the first being preparation, the second induction, the third maintenance, the fourth reversal and emergence, and the fifth post-operative management. The phase one, preparation. Although not completely effective, nasogastric tube to decompress the stomach and to provide a low pressure vent for regurgitation may be helpful. Aspiration through the tube may be useful if gastric contents are liquid, as in bowel obstruction, but less effective when the contents are solid. 
Use of clear oral antacids such as sodium citate may be used to raise the pH of gastric contents immediately before induction. However, this also increases the gastric volume. Particulate antacids should not be used as they may be very damaging to the airway if aspirated. Now, H2 receptor antagonist raises the gastric pH and may reduce the chance of chemical pulmonary injury. A gastric prokinetic agent such as metoclopramide enhances the gastric emptying and increases lower esophageal sphincter tone. RSI, that is the rapid sequence induction and intubation, is the method of choice in this patient. The goal here is to achieve optimal intubating condition rapidly to minimize as much as possible the duration of time between the loss of consciousness and the tracheal intubation with cough and the tracheal tube. Patient must be on a tipping trolley or table, preferably with an adjustable headpiece, so that the degree of neck extension or flexion may be altered quickly. Patient should be in the classic sniffing position with the neck flexed on the shoulder and the head extended on the neck. At least one skilled assistant to perform the cricket pressure, assist in the turning the patient or obtaining appropriate ED tube and supply of stylet and other things. Suction apparatus, airway and LMA should be within easy reach, an IV cannula should be placed and appropriate monitoring devices should be attached. Now pre-oxygenate with 100% oxygen for 3 to 5 minutes or until the end tidal oxygenation concentration is more than 85%. In extreme emergencies, this process can be quickened by asking the patient to take 8 vital capacity breaths. The heart rate, the blood pressure, the saturation and ECGs are monitored before induction of anesthesia. The assistant should be at the patient's side to perform Selix maneuver that is the quick pressure. A predetermined dose of IV anesthetic agent is to be given. This is followed immediately by succinyl choline at a dose of 1 to 1.5 mg per kg body weight without waiting to assess the effect of the inducting agent. Now, manual ventilation is to be avoided as far as possible. Now, as soon as the jaw begin to relax or fasciculations have ceased, laryngoscopy is performed and the trachea is intubated with cough and the tracheal tube. Creekweed pressure is maintained until the cuff of the ED tube is inflated and correct placement of the tube has been confirmed by auscultation of both lungs and the presence of ETCO2. Various drugs may be used for induction, such as thiopental, which has been regarded as the IV induction agent of choice of RSI. Thiopental provides rapid loss of consciousness with clearly defined endpoint. A dose of 4 to 5 mg per kg body weight can reliably be predicted to be sufficient for healthy young patient, but much less, that is 1.5 to 2 mg per kg body weight is needed in elderly and hypovolemic patients. Propofol at a dose of 1.5 to 2 mg per kg body weight causes greater suppression of the laryngeal reflexes but may cause more cardiovascular depression than thiopental, so it should be used with caution. Etomidate at a dose of 0.1 to 0.3 mg per kg body weight has the advantage of less cardiac depression but its use is limited by adverse effects of adrenal suppression. Ketamine at a dose of 1.5 mg per kg body weight has a slower speed of onset, however, it causes the least cardiovascular depression than any induction agent and is often used in severely shocked patients. Now, succinylcholine is used as the neuromuscular blocking agent for rapid sequence induction because it has two desirable properties. One, a rapid onset of action facilitates speedy intubation and therefore minimize the risk of aspiration and a short duration of action allows for a quicker onset of spontaneous ventilation in the event of failed intubation. These advantages of rapid sequence inductions are 
hemodynamic instability that may result if the dose of induction agent is excessive such as hypotension circulatory collapse or if the dose of induction agent is inadequate there may be hypertension tachycardia etc now if there is reasonable doubt about the ability to perform intubation or to maintain a patent airway in a patient with full stomach for example a patient with facial trauma epiglottitis the bleeding tonsil then inhalational induction may be used with oxygen and halothane or sevoflurane when the patient has reached a deep plane of anesthesia laryngoscopy is performed followed by an attempt at tracheal intubation now coming to maintenance of anesthesia capnography is essential throughout the anesthesia when there is evidence of return of neuromuscular transmission a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker is administered the choice depends on the patient's condition and cardiovascular status of the patient both atracurium and rocuronium is used but atracurium has virtually no cardiovascular effect in clinical doses and is useful in renal impairment the endotracheal tube is connected to a ventilator and minute volume adjusted to produce normal capnia maintenance of core body temperature is a very important aspect of interoperative management before initial surgical incision is made analgesia may be supplemented by intravenous doses of morphine at a dose of 1 to 5 mg or fentanyl at a dose of 25 to 100 mics now morphine is probably the analgesic of choice for emergency surgery other drugs that can be used include intravenous paracetamol low dose ketamine or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs after insertion of the last skin suture anesthetic drugs can be discontinued at this point clycopyrrolate 20 mics per kg body weight and neostigmine 50 mics per kilogram are given as bolus and ventilation continued to eliminate volatile agents until signs of awakening appear the end tidal concentration of volatile anesthetic is usually below 0.1 mac before eye opening occurs extubation should not be performed until protective airway reflexes have returned fully and the patient responds to commands such as open your eyes or lift your hand up the adequacy of reversal of paralysis may be determined by observing the patient's ability to sustain a head lift for five seconds it should be done in ot and immediately before extubation the patient is turned to lateral position if possible and asked to take a deep inspiration while gentle positive pressure is applied to the airway at the peak of inspiration the cuff is deflated and endotracheal tube removed as the patient exhales oxygen is given until regular respiratory rhythm is re-established and the patient has demonstrated an ability to cough and maintain a patent airway in the post-operative period appropriate analgesia and fluids should be prescribed before the patient is discharged to ward regular observation of vital signs fluid intake and output should be maintained good documentation and clear patient handovers between the staffs are essential